Hey you guys, this is Professor Vitt, and this video is going to cover for you the first four rules of implication for natural deduction. Uh, if by some strange reason you're watching this video and you're not part of the class, this is actually taken from um, Hurley's, what are we here, the 12th edition, but I'm sure the 13th is pretty close. Um, and, uh, and so, I don't know, there are many changes to logic between the two. Um, but uh, this is just an attempt to explain the first four rules um, so you can get some kind of footing. Remember, logic is almost by definition very unfamiliar to most folks. Um, very few people get it the first time. That's perfectly all right. It's important to remember that learning is effortful. And when it feels like you don't understand and it's difficult, that's just what it feels like. It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Don't internalize that and say, I'm doing this wrong. Is something wrong with me? No, it's just a process and it takes a while. So um, what I'm going to do, we have these four rules here, and then I'm going to work two problems, both of which incorporate all of the all of these rules that I just discussed. So this will give you a little starting point. <laughs> it won't be exhaustive and it won't be all that you need to do, but it would give you a good start. Okay, a uh, couple of notes. Um, here in the video, I use horseshoe, this for horseshoe. It's an arrow. The reason why is that the horseshoe symbol on doesn't have a shortcut and it's a big pain in the butt for formatting for Word. Also, the same thing is true of this ampersand sign. This is just what we call dot and what the book uses for dot. Um, the same reason applies. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in here to my screen a little bit so that you can see this a little bit better. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, first rule is called modus ponens. Um, it's the most basic rule of implication and it goes like this. Suppose I say if I'm in um, San Francisco, then, oops, then I'm in California, right? So this is a good idea, right? You, you can think of this. And then I suppose I tell you further that it's true that I'm in San Francisco. <clears throat> what could I conclude as a result of these two statements being true? That if I'm in San Francisco, then I'm in California, and it's true that I'm in San Francisco. Well, you can conclude that I'm in California, right? It's just the way that the world works. Um, there are lots of examples that you can use here. <clears throat> One of my favorites is <clears throat> if the object is red, then it is colored. The object is red, therefore it's colored. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's colored, meaning it has the property of having a color. It's not invisible, like Wonder Woman's jet, right? <clears throat> so this is just a basic rule of implication. That's what it means. We'll use it down here in the next problem, but that's just how that first one goes. Now, next up, we're going to talk about modus... Oh, one important thing. Modus ponens is always going to be bound... Uh, or rather, it's always going to need to use what is the horseshoe or the arrow. You can't use modus ponens with the wedge or the dot or the triple bar. It's just not applicable. So if you're using modus ponens, it better be on the horseshoe. All right, <clears throat> next up is the cousin of modus ponens. It's modus tollens. And uh, very often cousins <coughs> will bear some relationship to one another in terms of looking alike. You know, they're not exactly alike, but you can sometimes kind of tell. Oh yeah, these people are part of the same family. Not always. The same thing is true of modus ponens and modus tollens. Modus tollens starts off like modus ponens, right? If I'm in San Francisco, then I'm in California, right? But instead of then asserting the, the antecedent of this conditional, or rather, instead of saying, okay, I'm in San Francisco, you negate the consequent. In other words, you put a little tilde in front of the second part of the conditional, and then you conclude the negation of the first part. So what does that look like? What does it sound like? What does it mean? Well, let's run it. If I'm in San Francisco, then I'm in California. I'm not in California, so I'm not in San Francisco. It works with the Wonder Woman example, right? <clears throat> if it's red, then it's colored. 
it's not colored because it's probably invisible. So therefore it's not red, right? That's modus tollens. <coughs> modus tollens is also gotta be used with the horseshoe or the arrow all the time. You can only use it with implication. You can't use it with wedge or anything else. All right, next up, we have hypothetical syllogism. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna just refer to this rule as high school because that's exactly what it is, right? Suppose I tell you, because here's why. People in high school gossip, right? And it's a small community and once somebody tells one person, then that person tells another person, well, it just goes right through, right? Lies travel all around the world. So uh, let's give an example. <clears throat> let's suppose that, um, you know, Adam is talking to Bernie and Bernie is talking to Chandra. Well, if Adam is talking to Bernie, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit for you guys here. I'm already at like 200%, but maybe this will be a little bit better. Oh, that's probably, you're like, ah, oh, I can already hear you going, yay, I can see it. <clears throat> if Adam is talking to Bernie and Bernie is talking to Chandra, well, then Adam is basically talking to Chandra, right? I mean, that's, that's what is going on is just this free flow of gossipy information. That's all that hypothetical syllogism really does. It says, look, <clears throat> if I have two conditionals and one conditional implies something and then the next conditional uses as its antecedent the consequent of the first one, then the antecedent of the first conditional implies the consequent of the last one. That sounds very fancy, but all it really means is if A implies B and B implies C, then A implies C. That's all it's saying. Okay, last but most certainly not least, we have DS. Now I call this disjunctive syllogism, but it really stands for Nintendo DS, right? Now, <clears throat> that's just a funny way to remember it, but the way that it works is this, right? Um, suppose that you've got two options. You can have peanut butter or you can have jelly. And then I say, okay, um, you actually can't have peanut butter. Okay, well then I'll have jelly instead, all right? That's, that's all that disjunctive syllogism means. <clears throat> it just says, look, one of these options is, one of these options is true. It's not this first one, so it's gotta be the second one. Okay, now, <clears throat> how is this all gonna look? Let's work a problem and you'll see how it goes. <clears throat> now the first one is fairly straightforward. The second one is a little more complex. Let's work it. <clears throat> All right. Whenever you get a proof, you need to get comfortable with the idea that you're gonna start working it and you just need to look for an application of a rule without really knowing what, what else is going on or how you're gonna get to your conclusion, right? I have my conclusion here. They always look like this. Hey, here are your three assumptions or four assumptions or two or one, however many assumptions you have. And if you use these assumptions, you should be able to derive this thing. Um, so let's look at this problem. It's taken from Hurley chapter seven in the beginning part. So this is nothing original on my, on my part. What you wanna do is look for low hanging fruit. And what I do when I look at this proof is I see line one says A implies not B. And I look at line three and that tells me A. Well, you know what that is? That's just an example of modus ponens, right? If I'm in San Francisco, then I'm in California. I'm in San Francisco, so I'm in California. Well, look at this one. If I'm in San Francisco, then I'm in California. I'm in San Francisco, so what do I know is true? Exactly, I'm in California. So. Right here, I bring down the consequent of the conditional in line one, which is just the fancy way of saying the second part. Um, and I have to tell my reader, or my grader, how I got this. So what I do is I say, look, if, if you look at line one and you look at line three, then you apply modus ponens and that explains how I got this result, right? And that's all you need to do. So 
Notice that I haven't really addressed, gosh, what's my conclusion? How am I going to get there? Just look for a straightforward application of the rule. And at this point, when you're learning the rules, you're never going to get tripped up. You know, a straightforward rule application will always be good for you. And if you do a rule application and you end up not using it later on in the proof, that's perfectly OK. It, it's not wrong if you have extra lines in your proof. Now, <clears throat> I'm not all the way there yet. In fact, I'm not even sure how I'm going to get not C. But I do notice something that I can do now that I couldn't do before this step. Every time you derive a new line in a proof, it's always good to just refresh for a second and say, OK, now that I have this, what, what more can I do that I couldn't do before? Well, I see immediately line 2 and line 4. Looks just to me like modus tollens, right? Remember modus tollens? If it's red, then it's colored. It's not colored, so it's not red. This is the Wonder Woman's jet example. So um, if it's red, then it's colored. It's not colored, so it's not red. And right, so if it's red, then it's colored. <clears throat> it's not colored, so it's not red. And I'm going to, again, follow the same format in telling my reader, my grader, how I derived this. I tell them, look, look at lines 2 and 4 and apply modus tollens. And you, you will get this line. And wouldn't you know it, that's exactly your conclusion. So this is a very short proof. It's two lines. It's a little much because you've got a bunch of premises to work with. Um, I would encourage you, if you're struggling, put this aside for, you know, 30 minutes and then come back to it and see if you can remember how you got the first line. And if you can't, wait five minutes and think about it and then look at the answer, right? Um, learning proofs is a process and I always find, you know, 20 minutes every day is a, is a very good benchmark. You know, it doesn't matter if you do one hour um, every three days. I mean, that's good, right? But it's much better to do 20 minutes every day for three days than it is to do one hour and or one hour one day and then take two more days off, right? A little bit every day is good for logic and you'll do fine if you can do that. Okay, let's work our next proof. I'm excited to work this proof. I've worked it before, but I don't remember it. <clears throat> so we're just going to apply the rules that we have. Remember, we've already gotten comfortable with modus ponens and modus tollens, but we haven't talked much about hypothetical syllogism or disjunctive syllogism yet. So I would anticipate that this proof is going to incorporate both of those <coughs> very heavily. OK, so let's work on this proof. Um, make sure if you ever find yourself in the middle of a proof that looks impossible, make sure you've written it down properly. <clears throat> I haven't done that in this proof, and so as a result, um, I had an impossible proof. So just make sure it happens all the time. You make small errors, and it, it just happens. So here we go. Line one, premise one says, this stuff or, oops, this stuff, right? It's a big wedge. It's say it's a disjunct. You have two options, this stuff or this stuff. Line two, premise two says, not the first stuff, right? It's not, there are two negations right next to each other, which is fine, not all this stuff. So <clears throat> you can have A, uh, excuse me, you can have this stuff, or you can have peanut butter or jelly, right? Where the jelly's this big, huge, long thing. You cannot have peanut butter, so you can have jelly. This rule <clears throat> is just an application of disjunctive syllogism. So I'm going to just pop down with this. Let's take a look at disjunctive syllogism again. A or B, not A, so B. That's all I'm doing here with lines one and two. A, meaning the whole thing is A, or B. Then line two says not A. So I bring down my B. And so, <clears throat> remember, tell your reader what you did here. You, you say, look at lines one and two and apply disjunctive syllogism. <clears throat> now, anytime you do a proof, and I'm just going to take these brackets off here. I don't, I don't need to have them on anymore. It's technically okay if you have them on there, but I just clean it up. 
<clears throat> Anytime you complete a step in a proof, it's always important to stop and ask yourself, is there something that I can do now in the proof that I couldn't do before? Well, probably, very probably. Line five is a big, huge conditional. It says not paren E and F, close paren implies C implies D. <clears throat> well, if I look at line three, I see I have the first part of line five. That's just modus ponens, right? R implies C, R therefore C. If I'm in San Francisco, then I'm in California. I'm in San Francisco, so I'm in California. Let's look at our line here. <clears throat> if I'm in San Francisco, then I'm in California. Well, guess what? I'm in San Francisco, so I'm in California. So I'm going to bring down <clears throat> the consequent, and I'm going to tell my reader what I did. So I'm going to say, reader, look at lines three and five and apply modus ponens, and that will explain that line, <clears throat> right? Three, five, modus ponens. Okay, <clears throat> now, the next line is kind of exciting. Um, I take a peek at what I want to prove here, and what I want to prove is C implies G. And there's a way to do this. <clears throat> Remember high school? If Chuck is talking to Danica, and Danica is talking to, you know, Gordon, then Chuck is talking to Gordon, right? So we do C implies G. Let me take off this underline. And the reasoning for that is 4, 6, and it's hypothetical syllogism. In other words, <clears throat> if C implies D and D implies G, then C implies G. It's like a chain, right? <clears throat> um, and so that's how you derive your conclusion there. Um, now, <clears throat> I would encourage you to work these two problems a couple of times. Work them and then put them away for an hour or two and then come back and see if you can work it again. It's better to work one or two proofs really well than it is to work 10 proofs poorly. Um, yeah, so that's the first four rules of implication. I hope that was helpful to you guys. I appreciate your patience and um, please let me know if you have any questions.